Welcome to Heart Ranch again. We're we're live, Facebook Live. I suppose it's number three. We'll call the first one a trial run. The second was the pre-lesson lesson, which uh, hopefully, if you repeat uh, viewer, was helpful. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the pre-lesson lesson was. Just some basic things that uh, we would want you to know before you take a lesson. And today, we're going to discuss ways that you can improve that have nothing to do with hitting your golf ball or what you would call execution. So again, we, uh, we encourage um, questions. Uh, so please, if you if something comes to mind, throw it at me. I've got uh, my producer, Brett Gross, here again. And... Uh, with a much nicer day and um, so I'm going to be doing this for every week here for a while so I uh, might as well give you a little bit of history. Uh, I was a director of golf at a course in Makaha, Hawaii for I guess director for three or four years but anyway it got uh, purchased and closed and at that point I was I enjoyed running golf courses but the industry had become quite challenging with too many courses and not enough golfers and water prices where they were it, it was a struggle to make money and I was thinking about moving into just teaching I did end up going through another two more um, management jobs before I got comfortable enough that this was something that I could do and um, the point of that is is that after that job in Hawaii in Makaha I started taking everything in my head and putting it down on paper so that I could kind of categorize it and structure it all. So what we're going to do to discuss the areas that you can improve that don't include execution, I'm going to tell you what the six categories are. First is pace. I throw talent into that first category as well. Um, just It's kind of a beginning. Pace and talent. Introspection. You know, how well do you know your body's uh, abilities in, in your mind, how sharp is your mind, awareness which is can go from yourself, your mind, your body to your environment to how well do you know your equipment to the wind and the, the temperature and the air, uh, ground conditions, um, obstacles, all those types of things that we have to be aware of in order to decide what shot to hit and to be successful. After awareness is strategy what shots do you choose after strategies execution which of course isn't what we're going to talk about today and the final thing is chance and that is after your ball leaves your club head there's <laughs> you don't have any control over it so but what we do have control over is our emotions and and how well we handle the good or bad breaks I'm a believer that it evens out um, so those are the categories that we're going to discuss we have any people watching us yet, Brett? Oh, yeah. We've got several. Type in your questions. All right. Brett says we've got people watching. Um, so I guess I'll just kind of cover each one a little bit. You know, they're quite in-depth. But if we start with pace, it actually starts with the with how you get to the golf course, believe it or not. If, you, if you're rushing and, and you left the office and you need to get there quickly, and you're all wired up and you go right to the tee, um, you know, you, maybe some people may perform well that way, but usually that's not the case. Usually you need to get there a little early and get your, get your head straight and tone it down. Uh, other areas of pace, you know, when you're playing and you get held up, how, how many people do you know that their game goes to uh, HE double hockey sticks because they because they get all fussy about how long they're having to stay on a golf course, you know, worst thing you could have to do. But anyway, you know, pace of the play, uh, how quickly you go through your routine would probably be the one closest to achieving better results. Uh, I was home from Hawaii, oh, it's probably been three or four years ago now, and I ran into Tyler Ricketto, who's one of our, our better players in the Black Hills, and he had been playing some great golf, and I just asked him, I said, hey, what's you know what have you done different you know you got a teacher you're working with or new new equipment he goes no nope, Stace all I did was I started paying attention to the pace of my routine and I have found a pace 
where I'm seeing better results because of it. And his was he was going too slow before. And you'll hear it a lot from commentators on TV, you know, especially down the stretch when they're, the heat's really on, they're playing their last few holes. You'll hear them often talk about the players need to slow down their, their stride and they tend to get going too quickly. So that's pace. Um, talent, you're born with what you're born with. Um, everybody's got different levels. Uh, even the lowest levels, though, can, can achieve, uh, you know, their potential by putting time into it and getting, getting good instruction or, or studying the game. Um, and it, it is what it is. Uh, the, the more talented people get away with mechanical flaws and flaws that others just don't get away with. So like myself, I would consider myself in the, you know, maybe mid to above average range. And I very much have to go through a checklist um, as far as my routine to make sure that everything's covered as opposed to my buddy Ryan Messick who just puts the club in his hands and steps up to it and doesn't even have to think and he hits good shots. Same as my friend Shane Langstaff. We don't have either of them watching, do we, Brett? No, not yet. Okay. So that's pace and talent. No questions yet, right? Nope, nothing yet. They want to hear the whole spiel first. Um, let's get to something exciting. Introspection. Okay, no, not really. You know, introspection <laughs> is just um, knowing your body. Um, I caddied on the Pro Tour for one summer uh, here two, I think two summers ago for Will Collins, and um, that was my most eye-opening experience to introspection because a, a tour professional's job is 24-7. How much they sleep, how much sleep they get, what what they eat, when they work out, uh, even the bed that he sleeps on, you know, is, is a big issue because when you're playing for a paycheck, you know, all those things become that much more important. Um, and the one thing that I remember from him, uh, that when we're playing, he would, he would often remind me, hey, um, you know, remind me I got to get something in me to eat because he's worried so much about his golf that he, he, you know, can't remember everything. That's what a good caddy does. Get you your apple when he asks for it. Uh, so that's introspection, knowing your body, um, knowing your mind. Awareness is, is now we're getting, as we continue, we get closer to the things that are going to affect the, the everyday golfer. Uh, the better you get, the more fine-tuned it is and you know, a person who shoots 100 isn't even going to be able to comprehend the things that uh, Will Collins does. So awareness, though, is something everyone has to pay attention to, and it starts with with distance, knowing how far you hit your clubs. Um, Will and I would actually, every shot we played in a practice round, we would measure the distance his ball flies. Um, now that is a little tedious for, for the average golfer, uh, but nonetheless, it's very helpful if you start logging down your distances you hit your clubs in depends on where you're at too, right? I mean, in Hawaii we don't hit it. I hit it a club or a club and a half less than here because you're at sea level and there's more humidity. But paying attention to the yardages, uh, the wind, ground conditions, um, and what we're going to get into specifically, I'd like to pay the most time with here is uh, lie. Very important before you figure out, before you determine what kind of shot you're going to hit that you pay attention to your lie. And I don't know how well we're going to be able to see it on the camera, but that's okay. We'll just, is it? We've got some high def action going on here. The old, uh, the old, the old iPhone. So, especially, well, not especially around the greens, but around the greens, um, is the scoring zone and because you don't have as much club head speed you don't get away with the what you will with a full swing because you've got enough club head speed to get through poor lies uh, but with the slower club head speed you really got to be conscious of uh, your lie now it's not only whether you're where your ball is sitting but um, side hill downhill all that stuff comes into play but what we're going to discuss is is how the ball is sitting on the ground, and uh, a lot of people don't aren't conscious of it. I'm surprised when I play golf as I've traveled, and I'll I'll mention it to someone, and they'll be like, "What the heck are you talking about?" That looks exactly the same to me. But there is a big difference between whether the ball is sitting in a little bit of a depression, or if it is sitting 
up on top of the grass. You're you're just not as likely to get the, your golf club underneath this ball as you are this one. Logic says it's sitting down, it's further down. It's kind of sitting in a depression. It's a trickier shot. The one that's sitting up, you know, it's going to be much easier to get the club underneath. I can hit about any shot we want with this one. Um, so what you will ultimately go to, you'll go to what your strength is when you have a good lie. If you're a great chipper, go for it, you know, but you do need to also have a realistic perception of what your strength is, which I just, I'll tell you, that's just not the case. I, I get, I get people coming to me and, um, with a 25 year trained eye, they, you know, my perception of reality it differs from theirs and that's why they come to me. So, um, so I don't know what that's got to do anything, but come see your pro. Um, so the point was, if it's sitting up, you can do about anything with you, that you want. But the ball that's sitting down into a little depression or not up on some grass you can get underneath, you would want to use the lowest amount of loft that you feel like you can get away with. And in this case, of course, it would be the putter. We don't have any, we don't have any blemishes or bounces or clumps, no long grass. This would be an easy putt. But if this weren't such an easy putt and we needed to get it uh, up in the air at least to get it to here then we're looking at different clubs everybody following this yeah, I think so. yeah brett are you just making some sense to you i got it no questions i'm so explanatory that nobody has any questions no not yet and you just did join the video feed she so. did yeah, what are we, a couple of weeks away from partying right here for her and Matt. Um, okay, so let's get back, where was I talking? I was talking lie. Just pay, So simply put, a ball that's sitting down in the depression or not up on fluffy grass will require, or not require, your odds of success will be much greater with a club that has less loft. 56 degrees loft and <laughs> seven iron loft. I don't know what it is. So this is the less lofted club. This is seven iron. And the way we and the reason that it's safer is because to hit a ball up into the air with a with a lofted club, you've got to create speed to to pop it up. So you've got to go much quicker. And then if you happen to hit the equator of the ball because your club is going so fast, it flies over the green. So uh, sure everyone who's played golf uh, any amount knows that experience we've all had it so that's the reason that the flatter faced or the less lofted club gives you more room for air because you're, you're not having to generate that quick speed to pop it up you're giving it more like the same amount of speed that you'd give a putt and it comes off the face and, and if you don't quite hit it right if you get it a little high or a little low it's still going to go about the same distance that it would if you hit it perfectly. Whereas the old 60 degree or 56 degree, that's just not the case. We're working out here. Beautiful day. What are we putting in? New addition to the OC. Oh, the OC is improving, ladies and gentlemen. I was thinking it'd be nice to run you all through my, my do, new digs here because they're not the same as they were when I left. This was actually the clubhouse that um, we worked out of my first year, and then the second year we moved up to the big old fancy building. Um, and this has become the, the 19th hole, and great food, great beer, great television. You have a drive through And, <laughs> hey, if we got a drive through I mean, how many golf courses have a drive through I know it's less than half. Okay, so let's get to teaching some more, talking about things that you can do that don't have anything to, with, to do with execution. And, question uh, hey, question coming in. Just going to wait for this it. This is, uh, good morning. Good morning. This is your mom. Ah, nice. <laughs> I need new clubs this year. What should I buy? Or how should I go about it? Huh? Mom needs new clubs. Well, 
people don't realize it yet, um, Mom, thank you. I love you for calling. When I say I need uh, participation, I know I can count on my mother. Um, and what I was going to say was that people don't yet realize how important club fitting is. And so this fits in with the topic, Mom. You're perfect. Another way you can improve your game, and it does kind of have something to do with your swing because you're fitting the clubs to your swing, but once they're in your bag, they're your clubs. They got, you know, that's what you're playing. So it's extremely important. You know, I hear it all the time. Oh, I'm not good enough to get fitted clubs. <laughs> well, they, what those people that say that don't understand is they're the ones that, that need it the most. It's, it's the talented golfers that I was talking about earlier, the ones that have equipment that fits them great already or their standard height that, that are gonna, gonna, they're better off. Those of us with the less than ideal talent level, we need every advantage we can get to play our best golf. And uh, club fitting is the only way to go, in my opinion. You get some props for your uh, coffee cup there. Oh, it's my sister's coffee cup. That penny? That's Penny's uh, diagnosisart.com. <laughs> People like it. I like it yeah. too. Get some props here. Okay, so mom, the answer is come over here and uh, let Dustin fit you. He's uh, he handles our fittings. Of course, I'll help. Um, but mom, you you play great golf. Your clubs fit you great. No, I'm just kidding. Everybody needs fitted clubs. I don't even know how well they fit you. So Dustin does our fitting. If you, uh, if you ever need equipment, we've got a wide selection and we'll get the right clubs in your hand. And don't think that it's not important because it, it just flat out is. And it doesn't matter whether you're, whether you're a 10 digit or a single digit handicap or, or a 40, um, it, you still need it. Now a beginner, before you, know, you kind of build a swing, yeah, we'll start you with just a stock stock club off the rack. Uh, unless we're really going to do it right, we'd, we would actually start with a ping club, use the ping chart to fit you. Um, but a beginner, you, you know, you're not going to spend a fortune on clubs when you're not even sure you're going to stick with it. So you usually find some inexpensive way to get started. Make sure you like the game. Make sure you're going to have time for it um, before you get into spending the thousands that we do on golf clubs. But you don't have to. You can get them for hundreds too. So. Uh, that's the club. That's the club answer, mother. She's making an appointment. She's making an appointment. Love it. The um, back to the ways you can improve. Oh, you getting another question? Well, it seems like the, it's. Uh, can't believe my old Rams are going to be replaced. So is this football. Are we talking football on this thing now? Oh, who's bringing that in? Oh, my mom is bringing football into the... She doesn't want me to talk golf anymore, maybe. Yeah, maybe. She's, you know why? Because she's it's all she hears. <laughs> Let's talk about something else. Yeah, she got, she got a little cry, cry emoticon there. It's a Coors Light. No, sir, it's just coffee. <laughs> Okie dokie. Okay, um, so we were on... We did lie, which is part of awareness. After awareness, pace, introspection, awareness, strategy. Well, we've discussed strategy a little bit by, so your awareness of your, your variables will help you to then determine your strategy. You soak up all the variables you can. You take into account the distance, the, the wind, the, all the things we discussed earlier, and you have to come up with a strategy. Now, most people, because they're out here just playing for fun, are going to, you know, they're going to put it down all on black or however you say it when you're gambling. You're going to try the hardest shot because you're out there for fun. All right, we got a we got a question in here from Jason. Jason who? Hemrick. Ah, okay. Hemrick or yep. So, he's about a 10 handicap. My chipping is keeping me from the next level. Would like a recommendation. I would like you to recommend focusing on one club for chipping with say an 8 iron bump and run or try to get the 52 56 firing and I need to see more here he's got firing as well as what he has so looks like uh, like to recommend like you to recommend focusing on one club for chipping say eight iron or bump and run 
or trying to do the 50, the 52 or 56 firing as well? That's the question. Okay. Adam, you got all that? Adam asked if we're still filming, and I said, yeah. Our greenskeeper. Really? He wants to show us a pheasant. All right, Matt, back to, back, back to golf. Um, okay, chipping. Well, we're going to obviously go away from the things that you can do that aren't execution because this is execution, but it's, it's extremely important. Putting's, you know, arguably the most important, right, because that's the one we're hitting in the hole. Uh, but chipping, very important to give yourself a, at least give yourself a t chance to two-putt, you know, uh, for most people. If you don't hit the green, you know, it'd be nice if you can make your bogey, right, and avoid those doubles. As far as using one club, because you still want the ability, even with one club, you can hit, and I'm going to grab a pitching wedge, because if I was stuck to one club, I think pitching wedge would be the club I would use. Now, I would recommend that you don't just use one club and that you expand your game uh, and your skill set, but I understand the philosophy behind it. If you don't play a lot of golf, using one club, you're going to get this. You're going to get constant feedback from that one club, and logic says you'll become better at it. As opposed to if you don't play, you know, you're trying three or four different shots, but you're only playing once a week or once every other week. How good are you really going to get at those multiple shots without practicing them? So. That's the argument here is why would we just use one club and, and the reason is usually the answer would be just because you don't have the time to put into the game to master all the shots or to get to an ability with all the shots that you're comfortable with or ultimately is better than just using one. That's the, that's the whole key. Can you get better at multiple clubs than you are with just using one? But if we're just going to use one and I guess I'm going to hit shots this way because it's a little easier to see me. The back up just a bit, Steve. Back up just a bit? Yeah. Okay. Right there. Right here. We, yeah, everyone needs a stock shot or a staple shot. Uh, I call it stock. You have a stock shot and for the short game, well, for any, for any shot, it's, it's how much wrist action are you going to use and and how much acceleration are you going to use? And you want to find a, you know, you're not going to use a lot of wrist action for the most part on your stock shot. Your stock shot, you're going to use a little bit of wrist action, but you're going to keep it to a minimum, maybe. So this is no wrist action here. You see how my arms aren't moving at all? <laughs> okay, they're moving, but I mean they're not moving like this without my body or then my hands and wrists aren't flipping. So it's almost as if you're, you're here and you're just making this motion with your body, turning back and through. This would be the simplest shot to be able to learn to get good at and it actually becomes a little easier when you add just a little bit of wrist action. And keep your weight on your front foot. We want to hit the ball with a descending blow. And in order to do that, the handle of the club needs to be forward. Body weight needs to be on your front foot. Ball position needs to be behind your center or more towards your right eye so that we can catch that ball with a descending blow and advance it. This is very important, holding your finish. So that would be a stock shot. And then you learn within that stock or you learn to visualize that stock shot and plan it plan it out try and get the right amount of power now we were talking about how we can use other shots even though it's one club we can hit them lower or we can hit them higher so the more we de-loft the club the lower it's going to go so even with this club if i decide oh hey i, I don't want to hit it up in the air as much i'd like to get it lower I can get the ball back in my stance, I can keep my hands forward, and I can make impact with what we call a dynamic loft position. Dynamic meaning it can change, and because 
the static loft is is what it's built with right here this at this angle but dynamic we can make it go lower by bringing the handle forward or we can make it go higher by bringing it back so that's dynamic loft so we can get that dynamic loft lower keep the hands in front and hit a lower shot now to hit a higher shot we aren't going to back about a foot, back about a foot. to hit a higher shot we aren't going to take the club and put the handle behind the head because we still need to catch the ball with a descending blow what we do is we open the face and that's open and if we could do the same thing to hit it lower to go closed but because we can take the handle forward that that's easier but to hit it higher it, we the only way to hit it higher is to is to open up the face now we can max out our, our static loft and make sure that we make impact with that club as close to vertical as possible but you just it's just pretty much too hard to try and make impact here with the club behind the handle behind the ball it just doesn't work out because your club is ascending and we want it to be descending hopefully that this is making some sense <laughs> okay so to hit the higher shot we open the face and we swing on the same path that we would if it were square but because the face is open it's going to pop it up that way so it's going to go higher and it's going to go to the right so what we do is we aim for it so if i'm trying to hit it at brett this could be fun yeah, there we go. i'm going to open up my face and i'm going to aim the face of the club maybe slightly right of him because our path is going to be going this way which will pull it in a hair and i'm going to swing along my shoulders and feet still just like I would if it were square and by doing that the ball will pop up and go higher and, and go more to the right just over the cart okay so let's see did I get that did is that helpful Brett you think I answered that question right that's great and we do have a clarification the ram was referred to earlier were the clubs, but apparently we're too young to realize they were ram clubs. Oh, I wish that were the case. Maybe Brett. I'm too seasoned. I know Rams. My first pro in Hawaii was a Ram sponsor and got to meet Tom Watson. Tom Watson was a Ram guy. And the the Laser X2, if you still got the Laser X2, that was as good an iron head as a ping i2 uh, funny how they kind of gave the similar name maybe that's what they're getting at but they made some they made some really good golf clubs um which while we're here and have time and gets us back on the golf clubs <sighs> re reminds me to tell you that you can just because your irons are old doesn't necessarily mean that they're bad there certainly are some that are but there's a lot of good irons that were made um in the 80s and 90s and 2000s even obviously that were that were really good the the area where you're going to see that you've just given a pan out the area where you're going to see the the biggest change is is in hybrids fairway woods and drivers technology is has improved greatly in, in those areas and if your clubs it, it depends even those there's some 10 year old ones that are that are still quite good but in general, five or six years, if they're five or six years old, there's a pretty good chance that technology has improved to where you're going to see benefit from a, from a, from a fit and get the, the right. And it's not only the head. It, the shaft is a huge part of it now. And there's, those are areas where they're really continuing to improve uh, manufacturing. Um, you know, forging forging has been going on since, what, I guess I watched uh, Back to the Future 3 the other night, and they were doing it back then. It's the 1800s. So, you know, forging process has uh, is certainly gotten better, but, uh, but the, where, the area where we're seeing the improvement is, is the, 
precious metals or whatever you want to call with what the substances or content they use to build the heads, making the fins as, faces as thin as they can, and, and then really big time is the shafts. Okay. Hope you're all having fun. I am. It's beautiful out here. And uh, we're, I, I think I need to finish. Where was I? I was at, I did uh, strategy. We were talking about strategy. How can you improve your score with, with strategy well? You know, it's a, it's a gambling game. You choose to hit a shot that's a little outside of your, nothing's outside of your capabilities generally. You can hit that shot one out of a hundred times. You're capable of doing it, but that's the, that's the key is, can you hit that shot every time? That's always the safe strategy. How much are you willing to risk in order to get yourself whatever you're going to get through that, which is always the part that people don't understand. When you're factoring in strategy, always figure from where you're at, the location you're in, trees, water, whatever, if there were nothing in your way, could you get to the green? Could you get to where you're trying to get? A lot of times the answer is no. Even if you hit it perfect, you're not going to get it pin high. That's when it becomes a much easier decision to say, okay, well, even if I pull this shot off, it's not going to be, I'm not going to be putting for birdie or whatever your score may be. I'm still going to have to probably hit another shot to get there. So that makes it easy to say, well, if it's going to take me two to go 150 yards, I can go 75 75 if I go this way. If, th if I go this way, even safer. I can go, I can go 25, 125, whatever. So, and that's probably a little short on the distance for what I was getting at, but hopefully you see the point is that if you can't get there in one anyway, try and figure out the best way to get there in two so that you can manage your score. And that's, that's usually uh, what strategy comes down to after you've already taken into account the, the wind and the, the length and the obstacles and the ground conditions and in your physical state, um, you know, if you're really hung over, you probably want to swing easier and hit a club more. Remember Brownsville? Remember Brownsville? <laughs> a little tin cup action there. Uh, and that, so that's strategy. Uh, execution, uh, we're not, we got into a little bit today. Um, and then the last thing is chance, you know, once you're, Club leaves your ball leaves your club. You're, it's going to do what it's going to do. It's going to take some funny bounces and might end up in the hole, um, or it might end up in a hole like like that, which isn't the best. Okay, Brett, that ran us through pace and talent, introspection, awareness, strategy, execution, and chance. We didn't certainly didn't get into all of the the variables and all the things that we can do, but what I would like you to understand today, and the point that I was trying to get across the most, is that there's a lot of areas, a lot of things that you can pay attention to that don't have anything to do with how you hit your golf shot that you can use to improve your game. And of course, that's the big mental part of it, um, and which is why. A I have more fun now, to be honest, teaching on the golf course than, than the range of the putting green because you're out there in a real situation. And um, I've had students that I know darn well I got them swinging better, um, but it didn't necessarily mean that their score improved. Um, should, you would think, but, but that's not always the case. You know, you still have to, once you get up around the green, you still got to get it in the hole. So. That's why putting and chipping become so much, so much more important. And um, and I hope that these aren't too long and boring for you to sit through and listen to. But uh, even if you just get bits and parts, uh, hopefully you'll come visit us. Because yeah. it's beautiful out here, and we've got a great facility. We've got two big greens. We've got the public range, the private range. I can always take you out for to play a hole or two, which again is is my favorite, just to see. See what you really do, because another thing that you'll do when you're practicing, you, you, you're, really, you're relaxed, you're loose, there's no pressure on you. Um, I can get people on the golf course and 
even though you're not playing for anything, well, being in front of a teacher, of course, is part of the nervousness, but that aside, you still feel pressure because you, uh, you're you trying to achieve a score. Um, so that adds a variable to the game that you don't get on the practice range unless you try and create it mentally, and it's not that easy to do. So, any more questions, Brett? No, no more questions ah. here. All right. Get a couple of clinics and get golf ready to come up, don't you? Yeah. Yes, uh, I've got some people signed up for our first group lesson, which is called Get Golf Ready. That's a program the PGA of America and USGA, I believe, they're all involved in putting it on. Um, it's a, inexpensive, under $100 is the how it works for minimum five lessons, and you've got to get a little bit of golf course action. Uh, and I'm really excited about it. I haven't, my last two jobs weren't, they were indoor, and I didn't do any group lessons, the beginner group lessons specifically, um, which is something I really enjoy because um, I, I just love this game. I just, to me, there's, it's the best, and I want people to experience it. And it's not for everybody, but boy, if it's for you, then if I can help you get that striking feel to where you can advance that ball on a consistent basis, you know, there's, there's really no reason that you won't play unless. Unless it's not your thing, which is okay. But uh, but I'm excited. I've got some new new programs that I've been uh, doing that I've I've found proven results with, and see what kind of golfers we can make here in Rapid City this spring and summer, fall too. So that's that. Uh, HeartRanch.com is uh, our website, and the School of Golf's got links. Um, thank you to our uh, inquiries, Matt and Ruth Ann my mother. And uh, with that, I'll say thanks. Brett, you have anything to add? Nope. Great day. Beautiful day at Heart Ranch. Penny's art.